Okay, in, in, in this last session, there's just a, there's a, a few questions that, that I had, because now, you know, I purposely tried to structure, there's a lot of different applications of synthetic data. Um, and unfortunately, we only have one mic, so if, if the audience has questions, uh, you'll have to come up and get the mic, or I can kind of run it down. But uh, to start, just, just to start, uh, maybe we can start with Gerald, since you were just uh, speaking. And I'm, I'm wondering uh, if, you know, now that you've heard some of these applications based on what you, what you know, if you could just talk more broadly, what are the advantages of, of synthetic data generation and what are the things we need to worry about? Like where, where are the, uh, the pitfalls potentially, either from modeling? I'd just be curious to get everybody's view there. Uh, yeah, I think um, one of the pitfalls that actually comes across many times is when people create uh, synthetic, so it's, it's not generally true, but often when people create synthetic data, they forget the data processing inequality. They forget that it actually we can't really generate data. Data originally comes from observations and only comes from observations. However, if we're smart about it, we can do stuff, but we have to be very careful because in the end, we can generate data. Um, I'm not saying everything we said is wrong. It's it's not. And I mean, <laughs> I had myself a presentation. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying like every time we generate synthetic data, we really have to make sure that we really introspect ourselves of what we're doing. Because of course, it's very simple to think, okay, we're just infinitely zooming into that license plate because we see it on TV all the time. Um, and you know, it, it just doesn't work. We cannot, right? Yeah. Great. How about Bo? How about from your perspective? Yeah. So first of all, from the usefulness perspective, I think definitely from privacy perspective, it's helpful. And from the uh, like some rare event cases, like from safety perspective, it's helpful because if we collect the real data, a uh, lot of times, a lot of like rare events, we cannot see it in the real data. So synthetic data is really helpful in this case, particularly. And in terms of the pitfalls, indeed, um, like first of all, is of course how realistic it is, right? Uh, in terms of the distribution in terms of the, uh, if it's di high dimensional data, how realistic, say, images, and if it's uh, an LP data set, how uh, correct the grammar is, and uh, how representative is, there are all the um, uh, types of questions. But I think um, in terms of this, uh, like, uh, pitfalls that we can see currently, there are different ways to solve it to a certain extent. So I think we really, in terms of synthetic data, I think we really want to first know what we want to use them, like what's our goal. Uh, then we focus on the generation process because there are always trade-off. You cannot say, okay, I generate the perfect synthetic data, it can satisfy any purpose for any applications. Mm, that is too uh, good to be true, right? So for example, if we really want to train a model with the synthetic data, yeah, I may, in terms of say image, I may not care about too much quality, even though like the pixel looks weird, but as long as the statistics are embedded and the model are trained well and the privacy is preserved, I'm happy, right? So if I really want to train the child to look at those images and say, uh, to understand things, then of course the quality matters. So I think maybe the mm, application driven types of synthetic data is uh, important, yeah. Thank you. So uh, the utility is mostly uh, as we think about the accessibility or where, you know, Jeff, you also talked about the incompleteness problem, right? So the utility specifically lies in the fact that it makes research accessible uh, to a wider audience who might not have access to these uh, private or proprietary data sets. But in terms of the pitfalls, I really see right now we are at a stage where it's mostly tailor-made to the applications. Mm -hmm. we, we never, uh, you know, I don't know if they're, like, to my knowledge, I don't think there is a good way to think about generalizations or even transferability to newer applications or newer domains, which is perhaps we need to think more about if that can be achieved and how can that be achieved. I will probably agree with all the claims. What I like about synthetic data, and it's perhaps... You're free to disagree. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. So the, the way... I mean, I like to, to see machine learning mostly from a practitioner's point of view, although I have done research and I have a thesis. So I see 
synthetic data right now as a tool, as a tool in a, in a toolbox. And uh, we, can s we saw that this tool can get you impressive improvements on a, on a validation data set that we can even not explain yet, like uh, in the first presentation. We've seen that it can get you from zero, not to hero, but to a good point in, an, in a real application in my presentation. And we also saw that uh, it can uh, make things much more accessible. So it's a tool, and uh, as every tool, it has value. You discussed that it's not a panacea, I totally agree. It's partial, uh, it's uh, perhaps they are limited. Perhaps they are limited by the creativity that us humans put and effort put in the way that we generate them. And this with time may improve, but yeah, there is this drawback. Another comment I would like to say, what I love about this uh, track and synthetic data in general is that we need to move a bit away from machine learning being optimized towards a benchmark, because this is what most people believe. When you see data collection, you, when you start playing with synthetic data, you just understand that the field is bigger and vaster, and this gives you a better idea and uh, better visibility of the problems that may occur. And I love this about uh, synthetic data, because it's not taught enough, it's not something that we discuss a lot, and I hope that will become uh, more prevalent in uh, the community, especially with privacy preserving methods. Okay, how about from the, the audience? Are there questions, any of the presentations? Thank you. Uh, so my question is to uh, Bolde. Uh, so the adversarial uh, images that you showed that adding some uh, noise in a very mathematical way uh, could uh, fool a machine. Uh, my question is whether uh, if I'm in a good environment, not adversarial one, can the same mathematical uh, noise uh, can be used to help a machine like a train add a noise on real images, uh, but that could help train a machine in lower number of images uh, or something like that in a helpful way? Yeah, that's a good, very good question. So basically, indeed, like if your testing data is not adversary, right, but your test data have some natural distribution drift, say your autonomous driving is uh, trained uh, in the morning and you want to test it in the night, but it's all be night, there's no adversary behaviors. Um, those types of adversary data, indeed, can be viewed as sometimes a good data augmentation to consider some worst case and consider uh, some boundary cases for the scenario and for the model training. So usually, uh, I would say it helps empirically at least, for even for benign generalization cases. Yeah. There's a question back here. Yeah, it's actually a question for you, Jeffrey. Okay. Um, <laughs> so you <laughs> mentioned differential privacy as well in your talk. And if I understood correctly, the idea was that if you have the problem that some data points are missing but others are not, and you want to impute these missing data points, then what you could do instead of generating synthetic data for the imputation is you promise to organizations that you'll provide differential privacy, and then they'll kind of impute the data for you with differentially private data. Now, since for differential privacy, you need to add noise to the data, it's not immediately clear that this will be better than synthetic data. Because if you have very noisy data, this um, will still like contain information, like contain additional signal, but like for the downstream task, synthetic data might be better. So an idea might be to combine these two sources, so to denoise the differentially private data with synthetic data. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, no, th that, that is a great idea. I mean, I think the ability to denoise uh, data and then combine it with synthetic, uh, I, would love, I would love to do that. I mean, the, the reality that we've experienced so far when we're looking at different data sources is it's just, it runs the whole gamut. You know, so for example, there are some, I won't mention the states, but there's a couple of states in the United States where you can't get hardly any data. So almost all, and it's not necessarily that it's not collected, it's just not managed well. Uh, and so th that's one problem. And then you have the issue you're talking about where there are sources of data, particularly within the utility companies, 
where I think that your solution, which, which I quite like, I mean, you know, one, one of the problems in the differential privacy space, which, you know, Gerald and I have been talking about this for a while and with some other people, is that even if we deliver the technology to a, an organization and say, you know, here, I've given you, I've, I've got this executable, you need to do, run these steps, this generates a synthetic data set, and then we can now use that to train our model. Because of what I would call technological illiteracy in the compliance and senior management levels. Now, you know, I'm speaking, I, I, for many years I was a senior manager uh, at, uh, or I was a managing director at a, at a bank and then also at a reinsurer. And unfortunately, people in that age class, I'm a little bit different because I kind of grew up as a programmer, my first job was a programmer they're actually technologically illiterate. And we actually don't talk about this enough because this is where you get the breakdown. So I can demonstrate the value of the tech, but then people say, I still don't believe you. And, and one, one of the things I find extraordinary, because I've experienced, I won't name any names, but about banks specifically, is they will use easily hacked anonymization routines, and then they'll hassle you even inside the bank, and they'll say, well, we can't really share this data with you, even in an encrypted form. So, I mean, this is a different application, but, you know, I'm going to use fully homework encryption. I'm never going to look at it. I'm going to run machine learning on the data. And then compliance says no. But then they will poorly anonymize large data sets. People will hack the bank, the bank and then put all the data up on the dark web. And then you've got, uh, you know, identity theft. So I, so I think that part of the problem is actually education. And I, I just mentioned that because a lot of the people that attend this type of a conference, that's something we can all do. Because we really need to educate people to say, look, these are the issues, these are the risks, this is where the technology is, and I can put these things together to potentially solve some of these problems. But, but I do like what, what you're proposing. Some more questions? Did you have a thought? We got a question here. Uh, it's to all of you. Uh, it just uh, I would like to hear your thoughts on how society will perceive that uh, when we go and tell that this model or this technology is based on synthetic data than the real one. For example, uh, some clinical trials or uh, medicinal uh, discoveries are done with uh, synthetic data. So how we can convince people that uh, it's safe to use or your thoughts on that. Thanks. I, yeah, I think my thought is don't tell them. Um, <laughs> if it works, it works, you know. Other than that, don't don't ever think. I think in general, don't ever think society backs you up on anything. They're, they technologically, I mean, I'm just with Jeff on this. Um, if it works, it works. Okay. Other than that, um, the word syn synthetic is a bad problem, right? I mean, we know this from other fields, right? Food needs to be organic. What does it actually mean, right? Um, you know, I can, uh, I mean, it could be bio, oh, in, in Europe it's called bio, bio, right? I think it's a different, or green, right? Different sort of associations. When in reality, yeah, I pick a mushroom from the wood, it's about as biological as you can think. And of course, if it's the wrong one, it kills you. And so, so this has nothing to do with, with objectivity, right? This is subjectivity. And yes, absolutely, I would say, don't ever mention the word synthetic. Can't be right. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I necessarily I mean, agree with you, Gerald. I, I think we have to, to some extent, there's a branding problem, right? Yeah, it's you, a branding problem. You, yeah. you, have to, <laughs> you have to get people to accept the brand. But, but I think, you know, I mentioned this earlier in my talk, we need to develop institutions that do things like data certification, model certification. I mean, you know, the, the, uh, there are these utilities in most developed countries where the, where the companies rate appliances you know so if, if you ever seen when you look at the like the uh, the plug that you, you plug into the outlet often it, it will have a reference to like UHL or some of these different companies that I, I call them utilities because they perform this function well the reason why those companies exist is when uh, electricity first was invented or actually applied the biggest problem is stuff would burn down all the time. So you, you would, you know, some company would create like a new thing, you plug it in and it'd short the circuit and then the, your house would burn down. 
And so they, they uh, over time, you had these entities that developed, and a lot of people don't really pay attention to it, but you don't think when you plug your toaster in, it's gonna burn your house down. But that was like a real issue you know, in the early 20th century. I think we're in the same stage with respect to data and models today. And we really need to have these entities, these institutions, I prefer them not necessarily to be government. I mean, UHL is actually a, you know, it's a company, but they have this opportunity, potentially, or someone does, to go out and say, you know, this synthetic data generation capacity does in fact do what they say it does. And it, it, it has these risks and it has these advantages. Anyway, that's, that's kind of my, my thought on that. But you, you might be right, maybe we don't wanna, <laughs> don't wanna tell. Bo, did you have a, a comment? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, at the, we are at the different stages, and I indeed think that education is one very important point we need to tell people. And we also, as say, uh, I think from government and the policy maker and even scientists, we can make set of rules. As long as the synthetic data satisfies this, 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 and you people will be convinced. And usually, if definitely people are reasonable, and when you see this, you either agree or you come up with new rules, say, oh, I want this, uh, that's fine, we can add it so that we can verify the data, verify the process, we can show the simulation, it satisfy all the things. For example, from the autonomous driving perspective, again, like uh, people actually, the, I like uh, extract all the traffic rules and we show as long as your data satisfy all these traffic rules indeed with some certainty, uh, like uh, certifications actually, then uh, people agree. So give some reasons and then with as a black box, so I think it will be more, slightly more acceptable for to, to different people. So I hear more, you speak about the applicability of synthetic data in different industries. But we also see that in banking right now, there are a lot of synthetic data used to simulate risk, crisis, and so on, uh, much volatility in the market. Uh, and those people usually that compute this synthetic data, they don't understand the structure of the market, which sometimes is a problem. How can you ensure that? Because somebody said about you need to be expert in the field before you compute your synthetic data. How can you ensure that actually is going to work if you produce the synthetic data to, to somehow prevent this type of crisis and you know that your strategy, a strategy of a bank, for example, is going to work or the rate or interest rate that they are going to, to put on the market is going to work? and not create a crisis? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Well, it's a risky thing to have a, you know, a no control over the kind of synthetic data that's generated because it's like you know, uh, having a person who's not knowledgeable about the processes or the laws that, that govern the data the way it should be generated having them generate the synthetic data without any certification, as, uh, as Jeff alluded to, that we need that to ensure the data has uh, specific uh, rules that need to be followed is a dangerous thing. And, and specifically, I, I, I seriously think, uh, you know, people, in fact, synthetic data generation is one thing, and the other part is, um, you know, sort of a certification that what, what are the risks involved with this uh, generated data? What are the advantages? What could be some of the disadvantages? And for this, you just don't need a, you know, a, a set of a, you know, a software or a set of uh, domain experts who generate the data, but also uh, many other stakeholders who, who kind of can assure uh, uh, the quality in the data so that uh, cases where these are uh, very critical cases such as predicting risks or even uh, you know the life uh, the networks uh, d you know data that jeff mentioned about these are some critical scenarios where you cannot expect uh, terrible mistakes to happen but but i think one takeaway that is implicit in your question is that you need to it, it is important to have domain expertise i mean i i happen to have worked quite a bit in uh, stress testing for banks and pre and post 2008 for the, the, you know, the great financial crisis, there was quite a shift in the thinking in terms of the value 
of at least simulation and scenario analysis. I mean, that's a type of, of synthetic uh, data generation. And I think that it's more about educating people with respect to the benefit of particularly doing causal-based counterfactual sim uh, simulation. So, I mean, this is a little bit different than what we've been talking about for synthetic data generation, but I think that that's related to that point. Because the, the, the truth is, there were people, you know, for example, there were people pre-2008, you know, my, myself being one of them, who had predicted problems related to the uh, asset-backed security market creating issues throughout the financial system. And there were people that ran many simulations. I personally ran many simulations in 05 and 06, but you presented that to bank uh, managers, senior managers, and they would say, well, it's, you know, the probability is too low, or we don't need to worry about it. And then after their banks blow up, later they're quoted as saying, well, we didn't know it was, it was happening. And the truth is, they might not have known deterministically, but there was plenty of scenarios generated. So I, some of it's the framing. I think that's also part of it. You know, to some extent, you've got to get people comfortable with uncertainty and sampling error and bias uh, and some of those issues. So we know that in, we have kind of a risk that it's true or not true, but in financial market is a bit, and in banks is a bit quite complicated, I would say to, uh, let's say we take, uh, we have a scenario that is predict kind of a cra crisis, yes, in three years from now, and we, that is a problem at the time T. And let's say we generate this synthetic data, and in a way, it's saying, yes, there is 0.1% going to happen. And we start taking actions to, to prevent this. But actually, those actions, and we test it continuously, but those actions can actually increase the probability of happening and even happening. It's quite a probabilistic <laughs> problem, I guess. I'm not from statistics. Yeah, I'm not from statistic point, so. I'm, I'm really from financial side, so I'm looking at this because in the class, I just recently graduated and they say us about the, uh, applying this type of synthetic data to generate different case scenarios. And I'm asking because all the time, every, every decision a bank makes actually influence the whole system in general. But what about this? Okay, even if, let's say we, how we say it, you already, in a way predicted this, but what about if they would have acted and this, it would have increased or have worse action? Yeah, yeah no, well, I think that's the endogeneity problem in modeling particularly human issues. Yeah, it, it's a risk. Uh, I mean, there's, there's no question, but I, I don't think that should cause us to not pursue synthetic data generation. I think it has more to do with the framing of how it's used. Okay, actually, I, I've got a qu uh, question for Georgios. Uh, the, on your probabilistic uh, context-free grammar, you're assigning probabilities to all the different uh, grammar types. How do you come up with those to the point that you're comfortable uh, uh, with, with the actual probability? Because that's, that's an assumption yeah. with respect to what you're trying to generate. Know, it's, it's a very, very good point. And, uh, so, you can make an educated decision. So assume that uh, you have logs and you can browse these logs and you can measure stuff so you can make uh, educated decisions. But more or less these are random probabilities and what you want to ensure is that there is a good coverage of all the possible scenarios and then you just sample and sample millions of examples. This is why I said millions of examples. So that the model can pick them up sufficiently good. Uh, the most popular one, the model will pick them very, very good. And then once you have start having data, then you, you, do, you do the opposite. So you try to learn these probabilities, applying maximum, maximum likelihood estimations from the data in order to get a better grammar, more tailored to your, your user base, and then uh, get a better model that uh, is more tailored to your application. I mean, the good thing is the flexibility, but <laughs> with the flexibility comes a choice risk, and uh, this is how we have, we have handled it. Yeah, no, I, I, because, uh, I mean, I agree with you. I'm asking a slightly more nuanced question. The, the, you know, like, for example, it's one thing to train on Wikipedia entries. 
It's another to go to the New England Journal of Medicine and train on all the text written there, because it's a different type of language. And I guess that's really, you know, the, my, I, I think one of the themes that everybody's touched on in different ways is just having an application-specific set of constraints. I mean, that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. I don't have a definite answer to your question. I have an answer. I don't know if the best one. So when it comes to real industrial applications, I've seen personally that using Wikipedia is not the way to go. Wikipedia is not the corpus, the type of language that you would meet in so what, what corpus hospitals, do you use? in the medicine, what? What corpus do you use then? You need to use an in-domain corpus, and this usually gets you a very big lift. Take, for example, BERT and all these med models that have made the hype uh, on NLP. I mean, people tend to test them on Wikipedia, and they perform great because this is where they were trained on. And then you get BERT, you compare with TFIDF or BM25. Surprise, surprise, BM25 performs better in text. Why? Because it's out of domain, and uh, the patterns that you see in Wikipedia is not the same that you would see in your particular domain. So uh, th that's a simple answer. What do you do? Are the claims false? No. You just fine tune your domain, and then directly you see all these nice models that know something about language uh, doing better. So I'm very in favor of in-domain data, and I think that in-domain data is the way to go. And uh, yeah, the presentation was in the same. Uh, but do you are? Uh, I think the issue, which uh, and maybe this is a question for you, Akil, is have you found other sources of publicly available data, like the clickstream, that you can do something analogous to what you're talking about? Because I like this idea of finding, you know, effectively metadata or uh, other data that I can then use to synthetic synthetically generate something that I'm focused on. Because I, this is always a question, like what, you know, in the early days, you know, I've, I've been doing this for long enough, I, I don't do NLP so much anymore, but when I was doing NLP, we would uh, go on to the social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, and then they would shut us down. And so then we would anonymize, I probably shouldn't say this on the recording, but we would, we would take different approaches you know, until, and, and then they figured out to completely shut it down and then turn it into a business. And so it's been a lot, a lot harder. I'm just curious, are, are what corpora of data are out there? Well, Do you have other ideas? <laughs> yeah, well, to be honest, uh, if you're talking specifically about text, you know, honestly, I, I don't see uh, a better data source than Wikipedia to actually build mm -hmm. models at scale. I agree with uh, your guess the point that we need fine tuning, but it's about encoding knowledge for reasoning. At first, you need some data to f build models that can uh, encode knowledge. And then it's, it's natural that I, I completely agree because I've spent time in industry and I know I've spent, and I've spent time at banks. So I know the enterprise knowledge is much, much different from uh, the knowledge that's publicly available. But I, I think there is a harmony there that you need uh, first you need publicly available data sources and sc at scale so that you can encode knowledge uh, with models like BERT or BART or, or even uh, these transformer-based models that we are seeing now, GPT-3 and whatnot, and then fine tune them to your specific applications. It used to be a problem. I think we are making steps towards improving this model. So there is Wikipedia. When it comes to medicine, there is PubMed. You can crawl PubMed and get millions of uh, articles about medicine uh, that are freely available, and there are initiatives towards this. When it comes to patents, you have patent data sets that you can, uh, that you can use. Uh, when it comes to music, Spotify released a huge data set about uh, uh, podcasts, if I'm not uh, wrong, like, and it used to be like in URI IPS, which is like one of the top conferences in uh, the domain. Uh, there used to be challenges about that. And you see all these conferences, they come up either with industry tracks or with challenge tracks lately that try to motivate companies to get their data out, to attract talent, to crowdsource excellent solutions, things like that. So we're making improvements towards this. I mean, you found, what about uh, media sources, you know, like the last 50 years of the New York Times or something? Is that, I mean, I don't know, I'm not in the space. I wonder if that's available. Because that's, uh, although that's a different kind of language. <laughs> so, so we're doing something like that, as in, in our lab. We have a, a corpus called CodeBank, 
which is basically extracting quotations from speakers from news oh. articles. Uh, we made this public, like this is, uh, was available to us via Stanford, had some contact with Spinner, and my advisor uh, did his PhD at Stanford, so they had access to some of these things. But so the point was they, they have now uh, a corpus of quotations which are attributed to speakers over the past 20 years. And I feel this is a rich information source uh, from news domain. But one point that I would like to mention about all these data sets which Jorge has mentioned, they're only in English, if I'm not wrong, oh, right? Yeah. So multilingual uh, data sets are probably at the scale they are available now, are only available in Wikipedia. Uh, of course, even uh, the low resource languages exist, which are still a problem, but still you have some data that you can work with. And, and with this, like, I'll probably uh, have one question for you, Jeff, when you're talking about uh, the completeness problem. Uh, so I was wondering, have you thought, like, what's your take on crowdsourcing? Because I, I specifically uh, think about the Waze app. I still remember when I was driving, like, five, six years ago in the US, it, I still remember uh, they were so accurate at detecting, you know, if there is uh, an accident or uh, a cop car and you need to be aware of that and whatnot, right? So what about crowdsourcing in the specific applications that, that you were talking yeah, about? Yeah, well, you know, it's an interesting point. I mean, this could be, actually I can speak to this. I mean, the, the uh, one problem with crowdsourcing is, is somewhat analogous to the issue that was raised with financial firms. And that is that, you know, for example, I was an early user of Waze uh, when I would, would drive in San Francisco. And I mean, I, I grew up in San Francisco, so I've, I have a deep domain understanding of the, the road networks. I now use Waze uh, f to figure out where not to go. Uh, and so, but that's a problem if you don't come with the domain expertise. And that's because of Uber and Lyft and a bunch of people that move into the city every three to five years. So they rely on Waze and they end up going in specific places. So this is the problem with crowdsourcing and endogenous systems. You know, so this is, this is one problem. And then the, the other thing is it's hard to weed out malicious actors, uh, you know, particularly if, you know, some of the, the domain things that we're working on. But I, I used to be much more uh, optimistic about crowdsourcing, <laughs> but you, know, you, you see a lot of herd behavior uh, even in the crowdsourcing space. But it, I, I mean, we'll see. I mean, that uh, crowdsourcing, I think, is, is certainly, you know, an, an area that, that, that we could use. Uh, but I still like the, the idea of companies that have lots of data. I mean, I didn't even think about this until George was mentioned it, but you know, you could, you could uh, if you're a media company, you could take all of your text data and then turn that into a synthetic data set and make that available. Uh, you know, so that, you know, that, that would be, you know, potentially a business opportunity for for companies that, that sit on lots of data. Now that, you know, there, there are going to be a lot of issues around privacy and do people really uh, understand it. And actually one thing on the multilingual, because, uh, you know, I, I, did, I did NLP for a while. Uh, outside of English, there are two exceptions, Chinese and Japanese. There's actually a ton of corpora in both of those languages. Uh, now surprisingly, not very much in Arabic, not very much in Hindi, I mean, those are two giant country, you know, areas. Uh, and then, strangely, not as much as you would think for, I mean, it's probably getting better, but like German, Italian, French, Spanish. I mean, relative to these, these other languages. But, but, I, but I've, I've been involved in, pro, in projects in China, although you're inside what we call the Great Firewall, so it's very hard to move data in and out. Uh, but they've got as large a corpora as I've seen in English. So I think that, you know, that, that's, but uh, I would like to see more of this multilingual data sharing. Okay, actually, I don't know, Bo, did you have any final comments? Oh, just a quick ad for the Chinese English. Indeed, we have a big project uh, to co 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 like coherent them so that we identify oh. some inconsistency. So if there is some inconsistency, you know some news are fake or uh, something going on wrong, it's indeed quite helpful. Yeah, no, that'd be great. I mean, you know, the advantage of Chinese is it has similar grammatical structure to English, whereas Japanese is on a different planet, so it's, it's a much harder uh, problem. All right, they need to clear this room for the next session, so I want to thank our panelists and the audience members that made it here to the end.
So thanks very much. Uh, we look forward to more discussions in this context.